I spent a lot of time teaching at the University of Toronto and at Harvard, and then more publicly, looking at the core stories that motivate humanity. The core story is a hero myth. And the hero goes off into the adventure of his or her life and confronts the dragon and garners the treasure and brings it back to the community and distributes it. Okay, but in classic mythology, the heroes are virtually always men. And so the women in my classes always had a problem with that. If the hero myth is the central story of humanity, well, what does that mean for women? Well, in Christianity, Christ is the savior of women and men. And Christ's passion story is a extreme variant of the hero myth. And so there's a notion at the bottom of our culture that the pathway to redemption for women is the adoption of a heroic mode of being, you know, in the face of life's difficulties and, and problems. But there's more, eh? Because the thing about women is that their mythological orientation, I think, is it's multidimensional and complex. So there's a couple of other mythological variants that stack up beside the hero myth for women. There's Beauty and the Beast, where a woman finds a man who might otherwise be somewhat monstrous and predatory, but maybe is oriented positively in his fundamental nature, and she tames him. And that's a story of how women find a man who's sexually attractive and also productive, responsible, and useful. That is the most common female pornographic fantasy by orders of magnitude, Beauty and the Beast variant. And then there's also the image of women that's put forward, let's say, in Christianity, where you don't have an individual woman. You have woman and infant as a, as a unit, right? And so now I, I would perhaps hesitate to suggest that part of the reason that you felt isolated when you were pushing your pram around small English town is because in our society, I saw the same thing with my wife, by the way, when she had little kids, our society does not hold sacred the image of women and infant, woman and infant, as the fundamental unit of female, as a fundamental unit of female identity. Now, you know, women's nervous systems too, as far as I can tell, women's nervous systems are calibrated not for their own happiness, but for the joint success of woman plus infant. So women are more agreeable, which means they're more empathic and uh, more interested in people. And they're higher in negative emotion, which means they're a pretty good alarm system. Now that increase in negative emotion makes them susceptible to depression and anxiety. And that increase in agreeableness makes them susceptible to exploitation by psychopathic men. But it's very much benefit to their infants because you have to be agreeable to take care of an infant and you have to be an alarm system to be sensitive enough to detect all the threats in the environment that might be set a vulnerable infant. So, okay, so that should move us into the discussion of the third part of your book. It's like, this is a way of conceptualizing something approximating a female identity that'll actually work for females Possibly taking taking a, a very short detour from the book. I mean, on the on the question of why I felt isolated pushing a baby around small town Britain. Actually, the explanation for that was very simple. Most of most of my peers had a, had a year's maternity leave, which, by the way, is pretty good compared to how 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 things are for most American women in Britain. You have a statutory six months maternity leave. Everybody gets that paid maternity leave, and then you can take in a further six months unpaid. And most women take the full year, which is which is a staggering amount of maternity leave compared to the situation in America, where I believe something like one in three mothers is back at work pretty more or less before she's even stopped bleeding after having a baby, which to me is frankly just barbarous. Um, but leaving that aside, I mean, this is the how we got to a point where most where most women with dependent children work, and it's around 75% in the United Kingdom, is a long story in which the feminism of freedom is is int intricately bound up, as I'm sure, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, but but really the, the reason the reason I felt lonely pushing a baby around small town England was very straightforwardly there was no one to talk to. Because most women were at work. And and which and really that was, I think that was the first it was the first article I ever wrote when I when I first started to write in public was uh, was a, a reflection on the on the 
on the the slow draining away and the slow whittling away of civil society, which had taken place as a consequence of most women embracing paid work, which, to be clear, has a great many positive consequences, but also has had this effect that really it's only retirees and a dwindling proportion of pub- the, of the, those public spirited boomers who are left who are really holding holding my small town up in terms of having a functioning social fabric. Full stop. And you know, I clung, I clung to those older women who organised child baby groups and what have you, um, and and gradually I found a social life and you know, began life began to feel more normal again. But yeah, I mean, very very straightforwardly, the reason the reason I felt lonely was because I wanted to talk to, you. and 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 this is this is a this is a coordination problem, as a, <laughs> as I'm sure you can see. Um, you know, if if there's nobody to talk to, the only way for there to be more people to talk to is for there to be more people, and nobody wants to be no and no nobody wants to be a stay at home mum because there's nobody to talk to. So. It's it's kind of a vicious circle. But just secondly, yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. But just secondly, on the question of heroes' journeys for women, I actually wrote not in the book, but I, but elsewhere. I wrote a short essay about this a couple of years ago because, in my observation, there is a hero's journey for women. It just doesn't follow the same track as the male one, um, and in fact, it has three parts which correspond to a very ancient archetype for for for, for what a woman, for, uh, a very ancient female archetype, which is the maiden, the mother, and the matriarch, the triple goddess. Who's a figure out of out of some pagan traditions? Some uh, in in which you know, they, these are the three faces of these are the three faces of the same goddess, as it were. But they 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 take on different aspects at different parts of a woman's life. And anecdotally, to me, it stacks pretty closely with what the, what actually a majority of normal women's lives look like. You know, as the maiden, you're free. You you have a sort of warrior aspect. You and, and perhaps that's the point where you're pursuing you're pursuing ambitious professional projects. Um, the mother is more oriented towards home and the domestic sphere, and you know, probably probably just doesn't bluntly doesn't care about work as much. I mean, I know, I know a great many very high powered maidens who reached motherhood perhaps in their early thirties and then just found they they just didn't care about the deadlines and the spreadsheets anymore. Couldn't give a stuff. I mean, this anecdotal. I, I'm sure, yeah, uh, anecdotally, that's pretty common. And then, uh, but then later on, and this was something that I found very interesting when I did a psychotherapy training in the late in the late aughts and early tens was just how many of the just how many of the trainees on that on that course were women in their late in their 50s and 60s so these were women who for the most part already had already had young adult children their kids had gone off to university or, or were soon to leave for university um so they'd pretty much done the motherhood arc they'd done the mother part of that and they were moving into a new phase of life they were moving into into what i think of as the matriarch space i mean the i think the the classic three-part goddess term for this is crone. But I mean, you know, they were some way from cronehood. These were lively, vital, energetic, public-spirited women who had some life experience. They had a lot of connections. They had a rich social life. They'd met lots of people and, and they were ready to give something back. And, and uh, what I've, and I've, it's in my observation, there are a huge number of women who reach the end of the mother arc the the mother part of that hero's journey and then and then embrace some uh, perhaps some, uh, and will then retrain so they'll have they'll have three careers they might have a so so they'll be very professional in their 20s they'll be a bit more a, a bit pretty somewhat more part time maybe 30 to 50 and then they'll then they'll retrain and they'll do something like psychotherapy or they'll do ministry or they'll do uh, spiritual counseling or they'll do some or or or, or in, in some other way become involved in the community and, and they'll want to do something public spirited and give back. And and those and those those women are a hugely rich force for 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 deepening deepening reflection in the culture for 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 public service for all manner of all manner of incredibly positive, uh, usually quite self-effacing, but incredibly positive, constructive and you know life-giving. Um, contribution to to the social fabric, and they're and they're they're incredibly marginalised. In, uh, they're they're almost completely invisible in terms of the liberal feminist narrative, which really centres the maiden, and it wants to foreground the maiden and to t- and to tell women that the hero's journey means essentially being the maiden for their entire life. And everything else is just, you know, the mother is pretty much, the, you know, at best, if the mother is noticed, it's as a problem to be solved. And and the and the matriarch doesn't really get a look in at all. And if she does, it's only so that she can be denounced for being a turf. 
or you know in in some other way you know spat on for being you know a dinosaur or obsolete or you know old fashioned or you know <laughs> out of touch or, or or in some other way irrelevant or or ridiculous and in fact these women are the backbone of the social fabric i mean those are the women who are making who are making cups of making weak cups of tea for slightly traumatized new mothers like i was in small town england <laughs> and telling me i'm doing fine and really that mattered a lot at the time you know those are those are the women who are running who are running brownies groups for no money at every every Wednesday because they can and because they want to give back. Those are the women who are who are retraining as counselors and helping helping traumatized people for free. You know, those, those are the women who keep things going. <laughs> and 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 yet somehow the the liberal feminist version of the hero's journey just doesn't see them at all. And I think I I, I and I, so I've been very keen to make a case for 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 a, a, a richer, if you like, a three part um, to to. Opening a space for thinking about women's heroes' journeys in 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 a more spacious way, which actually just observes what life looks like for for mothers and for uh, in, in in the in in the arc of what 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 the average woman's life looks like when when she does have a when when she does become a mother. Mm-hmm.